So a pedagogy is a way of teaching, and the divine pedagogy is God's way of teaching us. And we see this happening in the Bible. So God taught his people throughout the Old Testament, and then God himself became man um, in Jesus in the New Testament. And so we see that throughout the entire Bible, God is the teacher, and we imitate his way of teaching us in catechesis. Welcome back for our second lesson for the Art of Catechesis. Uh, the first one focused just on what is catechesis, giving us an, an overview of what we're trying to accomplish in the Art of Catechesis class, but obviously what we're trying to accomplish through our ministry in catechesis. We're now moving to the Bible, to the Word of God, um, as the foundation for catechesis. Why is this so essential? Well, think about it. The Bible is the very Word of God. In catechesis, we're trying to share the Word with others. So we begin with God's own words. And catechesis, remember, means echo. So we echo the words of God in our catechesis, and we share them uh, with others. And so we're going to be looking at why both the story of the Bible, uh, but also just the Bible itself, is so crucial for catechesis. We're going to do another Lexio. We were looking at Luke's uh, Book of Acts uh, in our first Lexio, and, and now we're going to go back into Luke's Gospel to chapter 24. This is the chapter that describes the resurrection. Uh, and so on the very day of the resurrection, uh, some of Jesus' disciples were leaving Jerusalem, and they pretty much were, were leaving in defeat. Uh, they said, okay, everything's over now. Right? You know, Jesus died. Uh, where do we go from here? There's not two of the uh, 12 uh, apostles. These are two of the broader group of disciples. And so they're walking from Jerusalem to the town of Emmaus. And we will see what happens uh, from here. So this is Luke uh, 24, 13. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation which you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad, all right, so once again, they, they thought everything was over. They looked defeated. They were sad. And one of them, named Cleopas, answered, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since this happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. And they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. What's interesting here is that the disciples are looking sad even though the resurrection has already been proclaimed to them. So what this means is that they've received the message of salvation, but they didn't believe it. You know, they're kind of like Thomas. They're like, yeah, I don't, I don't really believe what you're saying here. So this is crucial, you know, from our viewpoint in, in catechesis, because think about that. So many people have said that they've heard the word, but it is not taking root. You know, they're, they're not firmly uh, believing. 
And so Jesus rebukes them. And he said to them, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them and all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He appeared to be going farther, but they constrained him, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished out of their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven gathered together and those who were with them, who said, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. So this is really a crucial passage because we see Jesus himself doing catechesis here and he's teaching about himself, but how does he do it? He himself uses the Old Testament and he's telling the disciples the story. He's connecting all the dots in the Old Testament and he's showing how it all points to him. How what happened, these events in Jerusalem that they were speaking about, how it all was fulfilled in his death and his resurrection. So what we see here is Jesus himself giving the story of what we call the narratio, which is simply Latin for the narration, the narration of salvation history, which is the story of the Bible. Um, and it's very interesting that it's through the scriptures that the disciples recognize Jesus. So we were just saying that, you know, the Bible is so crucial because it's God's word addressed to us. And so that is how we begin to recognize God. Uh, through the scriptures, we begin to learn who Jesus is, to come to know him, to come to know the plan, right, that Jesus was talking about, this plan of salvation. It's also very crucial that Jesus is undertaking a dialogue with the disciples. Uh, so he's not just lecturing them, or he's asking them questions. He's like, even though he knows, you know, what's happening in Jerusalem, he says, well, tell me about it. Let me hear what you think is happening. Let me hear this from your point of view. And so the scriptures and the events of salvation becomes a means of this back and forth dialogue, uh, of, of asking questions, getting the answers, and having this dialogue progress into the teaching. This is a very important method uh, for us in catechesis. The story also is laid out step by step. Uh, and so we're going to talk a little bit more about this uh, in this lesson about what are the major steps of salvation history? How can we just get a very simple grasp on all the steps um, that come into the story? And most importantly, and this is so important for us as Catholics, the story of the Bible that is told in this dialogue between Jesus and the disciples culminates in the Eucharist. Right? They didn't see Jesus. Even as they're talking about the Bible, Jesus is telling them all about himself, Right? They don't fully grasp it. They understand the story, but they haven't entered into it yet fully. And it's actually when Jesus breaks the bread, which is the description of the Eucharist, even that we saw in the Acts of the Apostles in our, in our first Lectio, Lectio in Lesson 1. Uh, and so the Eucharist opens up the story and makes it present. You know, when we say, when Jesus said, do this in memory of me, and the priest repeats this at the Mass, the memory is making the events of salvation history, especially Jesus' death and resurrection, present to us through the Mass. And so this scriptural understanding of catechesis is also liturgical because the liturgy makes the realities of the Bible present to us right there and then. It's not something we're just talking about in the past, right? But this dialogue leads us into communion with Jesus. 
It's part of the reason why this is just such an important passage uh, for catechesis. And it's just so beautiful when you hear the disciples reflecting back and they say, were not our hearts burning within us? This is really what we're aiming at, right? We, we want our own hearts to be burning with the love of God. And this is why we began, you know, talking about the role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in our hearts sets them on fire so that uh, in learning about Jesus and teaching about Jesus, our hearts are on fire and we want this fire to be contagious. The conversation that Jesus was having with the disciples was all about trying to get their hearts on fire. And so the story with the Eucharistic celebration opened up the scriptures and the story and the presence all to them. And it clicked, right? And so they went from being sad and doubting Jesus to then going back and proclaiming to the other apostles and the disciples, and of course also hearing their testimony that they had also seen Jesus, that Simon had seen Jesus. So this is what we want. We want to be on fire. We want to help others to be on fire and to share this testimony and lead others through this story as well. So I'd like you to pray through uh, this passage um, in Luke 24 and to pray about it yourself and to discuss what comes to you in prayer uh, with those in your group. What's marvelous about the Bible in terms of catechesis is that just like we saw in Luke 24, the Bible shows us how God teaches. So when we're thinking about how to teach the faith, we simply look and say, okay, well, how did God do it? How does the Bible describe the process in which God has revealed himself to his people and formed the church uh, and revealed his inner life to us? We call God's teaching the divine pedagogy. So divine, of course, meaning related to God, and pedagogy simply meaning the method or way of teaching. So we look at God's own teaching. In the ancient world, the pedagogue actually meant the slave who was responsible for leading the child to his lessons. The pedagogue was not actually the teacher. Uh, he was the one employed by the family. Well, if he was a slave, he wasn't employed, but he was the one responsible for taking the, the child by the hand and leading the child to the lesson, and then after the lesson was over, making sure uh, that the child did the homework and, and understood the lesson. So it, the pedagogue was not even the teacher, but the one responsible for making sure that the lesson was understood and that the work was being done. And so we see a similar idea that God himself is the one taking his people by the hand and leading them through salvation history step by step by step. And one of the things that we see is that God is very patient. He, he is a perfectly patient teacher. He has the end in mind, and he knows that we are going to fail the lessons that he gives us. And yet, even in and through our failures, he will continue to lead us. He will continue to guide us and make sure that we're still getting to the place where he desires. So if we look even at the beginning of the story, right, in creation, we see that we said no, like our first mother and father said no to the plan, and yet God worked through that even, and he continued to guide his people. I get asked a lot of questions, you know, even just teaching salvation history and the story about why didn't God teach his people this and that sooner? And as he really laid the groundwork step by step. And he didn't rush ahead and do things that people weren't ready for. He was patient. He said, I know the order in which people have to learn. And so when we get the kindergartners coming in, we don't say, okay, let me tell you about the hypostatic union right now. Let's get into it. Or let's talk about transubstantiation. It's like, no, that's not where you begin, right? You, you, you begin by helping people to understand that there is a God, that God is the creator, that God loves us, that he forgives us our sins, right? And, and you build from there uh, with the kids step by step. And so God has done the same thing. So we put up here 
uh, just a few of the major characteristics. This is not exhaustive, uh, but these are some of the major characteristics of the divine pedagogy, of the way uh, that God has taught us. And as I've just said, it's very gradual. God did not just say, here's everything I have to tell you right now, you know? It's, no, step by step. Okay, the first thing that we have to know is this, right? And so we think we're going to go through the steps of the story, but what we see is that it builds one off of the other with the steps, with the revelation becoming progressive. That it has a goal. The goal is our salvation in Christ. And each of the covenants or prophets that we see in the Old Testament are building up to that more and more. And as the Old Testament goes on, it gets clearer and clearer. And so we see another element of catechesis, part of this echoing, is that the Israelites handed down the stories and the revelations and the prophetic messages from generation to generation. And so the, the revelation was progressive, not just in what God said, but also in the way that he said it, building upon the previous revelations that were handed down through generations. Right? And this is important for us to understand our own role. Right? We are part of this process. We continue God's pedagogy in the church by handing on his revelation uh, to his people and continuing it and preserving it. And of course, the magisterium, the bishops of the church, have a particular role in that. But catechists do too, because we are preserving the message um, in our own parishes and our families and, and passing it down. Uh, God, the way that God teaches also is through stories. We get the story of creation and so many other stories in Genesis, most importantly, Noah. But then we get the story of Abraham and the other patriarchs coming. And when we think of catechesis, right, kids get into stories. If you just, you know, produce the doctrine in an abstract form, people lose interest. They, they think it's boring. And so God understands this about us. He understands that we are storytellers and we love to listen to stories. That's why people even like going to the movies today because they, they want to see the story and how it unfolds and they want to see the resolution. And so the Bible is one long story from creation uh, to the fulfillment of creation and the new heaven and new earth and revelation. There's a coherent narrative. And there's so many smaller stories within the overarching story, right? So we can say that there is one story, but there's thousands of stories within it. And we can use those stories um, in our own teaching just to, to grasp uh, the kids' attentions. Um, God also adapts to our limits and needs, right? The fact that God even uses human words at all is a big deal, right? So, I mean, we think of Jesus. He is the very word of God. He contains all truth within himself. He is the truth. And yet God speaks to us in a human way, right? Using the Hebrew language in the Old Testament and the Greek language in the New Testament. So God is adapting himself to our culture, to the way that we understand things. Um, and he speaks to us in a way that's adapted to our particular needs. And so, of course, that's crucial in catechesis, just as we're saying, you don't want to go in and treat kindergartners like you're talking to high schoolers or, or adults. So we have to adapt the truth that we know and the message that needs to be conveyed in a way that's appropriate to each audience and what they're ready for at that moment. And so that's part of the reason why we see this progressive narrative through time is that God knows what we need at that moment, and he works with us. He works with the limits of our own nature. And part of the way that he does this is by using visible signs and events. We could describe his pedagogy as sacramental. And what we mean by that is not just about the seven sacraments. Sacramental means that there's a, a visible sign of, an, of a hidden or invisible reality. And so God uses the figures and historical events and even the very human words themselves as signs of the spiritual realities that he wants to communicate to us. And so we do the same thing um, in catechesis, right? We're adapting the words for the audience. 
We want to use signs. We want to use experiences of prayer and other experiences to convey the spiritual teachings that, that we have to give. So we need to have this sacramental pedagogy as well. The way that God teaches is that everything in the Bible is ordered towards the very center of the message in Jesus. Jesus is God become man. He is the, the complete revelation of the Father. And so everything in the Bible, in the Old and New Testament, centers on Jesus and points to Jesus. He is the meaning of the Bible. And so it's the same in our own catechesis. Everything we do is about bringing people into communion with Jesus. So he helps us to understand the purpose of catechesis through this communion with him. Now, Jesus was also a teacher, as we even saw in our Lexio, as he's walking with the disciples and explaining the story. But we also see, I mean, throughout the Gospels, how Jesus teaches through parables, right? He's using stories. He's using signs and images. Um, and he's also performing actions to manifest uh, the teaching as well. And he's praying, he's healing, he's expelling demons, Right? And so our teaching is never just an idea. Right? We're praying with people. We want people to experience the power of God in their lives. And people can have this you know, huge experience of grace, of healing, of deliverance when they meet Jesus. So the signs and wonders that we even saw in our first Lexio and Acts, they continue in the church. You know, the, the church is this miraculous place of meeting God because Jesus is working in and through us. He's speaking directly to us when we're reading the Bible. He's meeting us in the breaking of the bread, and he's there present in our own teaching because we are representing him. We become his instruments when we're teaching catechesis. And so we should expect to see some of the same things that happened in Jesus' own teaching if we are really relaying his message faithfully in prayer. Uh, and finally, why did God even give us the Bible? Why does God teach us at all? Even though we're sinners and we turned our backs on God, why did he come to us and become man and pull us back to him? It's love. St. Augustine said, you can interpret everything in the Bible through love. It's an act of God's love, and it's meant to inspire love in us. And so the Bible is like one long love letter from God, meant to draw us into a relationship with Him. And so that's one reason why it's really important to have a deeply biblical catechesis, so that we are presenting this message of love from God and helping people to respond back. And when we pray with the Bible... It's basically God giving us the words even to pray back to him, especially in the Psalms, right? The Psalms are God's revealed prayers that he gives us to be able to say back to him, like our response to the love letter already written for us. So the Bible is all about a relationship with God in union with God. And when we help other people to find uh, Jesus in the Bible, to discover him in the Bible, we are doing exactly what Jesus did on the road to Emmaus. We are accompanying other people in this journey to find God and to be happy with him forever. So this is the, the deepest meaning of catechesis, and the Bible uh, makes this clear for us. Now let's get into salvation history itself. What are the major steps of the story? Well, we begin in the beginning. Uh, what we're going to go through is a series of covenants, right? And a covenant um, is a kind of contract, but it's deeper than a contract. It's an exchange of people uh, that unites them together, like in a compact, a sharing of lives. And we see this in our own experience, mostly through marriage, right? Marriage is not just a contract. And a lot of people think that in our society, which is why we allow divorce, right? Well, we entered into this contract so we can break the contract. But rather, marriage is a complete giving of selves uh, to, e to each other, 
that creates this new reality, creates this new family. And we see that the Bible is actually a series of covenants that God makes with us where he does the same thing, where he gives his divine self. He is infinite. He's totally beyond us. And yet he comes to us in this exchange of persons. And he enters into this binding union with us where one way in which a covenant is different than a contract is that it's still binding even if one side breaks their responsibilities. And so even as we break covenant with God, he remains faithful to us. And so we see that even as we have this progression of covenants, God is always faithful to what he did in the prior covenants. And so the covenants build on one another and are completed in the final covenant, which fulfills them all and fulfills God's obligations that he made through them all. So, as I said, we begin in the beginning with the covenant of friendship that God made with Adam and Eve. Right? He placed them in the garden. And there you can see the two sides of the covenant. Right? He put them there and he gave them a series of gifts right? to be free of sin, to have knowledge and grace infused within themselves, to have the preternatural gifts of not suffering and not experiencing death. And their side of the covenant was to obey God, not to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And what does that mean? You know, one thing that's important to understand, and John Paul and the Catechism both make this clear, is that these early stories in Genesis were written intentionally with mythical language. And when we say mythical, what does that mean? That they're all just fictitious and made up? No, it means that we're using, that the, the authors were using this language of myth to hit at things that really happened and that have an historical nature, but they're not giving us a precise historical narrative like you would get in a history book, right? They're hitting at these overarching truths um, using this particular language to give us the theological truths that we need to know about creation um, and then the fall. All right. And so this, it's the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, what it means in the story using this language, this allegorical or mythical language, is that God himself would help them to know what is good and evil. But the temptation that they received from the devil was to put themselves in the place of God and to say for themselves what is good and evil. Right? So that they, they were not you know, following their obligations of obedience in the covenant, but broke the covenant. But God was still faithful, and we see this right away, that after the fall, God promises that, that the descendant of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. So he's already saying how he will respond to the unfaithfulness of Adam and Eve. He will still bring us to salvation in the midst of that. So this is the basic covenant of love that God has made with humanity. And as I said, it's still binding in the sense that God is still showing us love even after the fall, even when we receive uh, these effects of original sin. Some people ask me, well, why is it fair uh, that we have these effects of original sin when we weren't the ones committing the first sin? And I describe it as, you know, the gifts of the garden were almost like a bubble around Adam and Eve. And as they would have children within the garden, right, the children would be receiving the gifts. Uh, but original sin, the first sin, popped the bubble. And so now all the descendants of Adam and Eve are no longer born in the garden. So they no longer have the, the original gifts that God intended for us. When we look at the other covenants uh, which follow the original covenant, we see God step by step enacting this plan of salvation to overcome human sin. Uh, the first step is with Noah, uh, where we have a renewal um, of God's covenant with creation itself, is that in the fall, human beings were defacing God's creation and his plan uh, for man and woman. And so we see, uh, specifically through murder, the text says, how people were turning against God's plan. And so... God renews creation through the flood. And, and this is an allegorical sign 
of the final salvation, right? This cleansing or washing with water, uh, that would happen through baptism. The water that flows from Jesus' own side um, out the side of the temple to, to renew creation um, and humanity itself. We look at the next covenant with Noah and what we see, I mean, sorry, with Abraham. And what we see here is that God is founding a people, a particular nation um, that he would use then to bring uh, salvation to the entire world. So he was very clear to Abraham that from him that he would make a nation, that so from this people there would be kings who, who would come from him, and that his children, um, through his children, right, and through Abraham, all the nations of the world would be blessed. Right? This was God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12. So once again, we see that the history of Israel and Jesus are promised to Abraham that Jesus would be the one to extend the blessings of Israel to all the world. But it's gradual, it's progressive. It begins with Abraham and his descendants. And God lays the foundation through them. Um, and we see this foreshadowing of salvation very clearly in the sacrifice of Isaac. You know, this passage really bothers people. They're like, how could God command human sacrifice, right? I mean, God hates human sacrifice. He put an end to it, you know, in the Holy Land itself. But we see in Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his beloved son um, out of love for God, and, and God stopped that sacrifice, but we see that, that God the Father would not stop the sacrifice of his own son, who willingly embraced death for the salvation of the world. So you see a very clear allegorical foreshadowing in that passage. Okay, in Moses, right, the people are freed from slavery. And so the gospel is very clear that Jesus is bringing about a new Passover. So the Passover freed the Israelites from a physical slavery. It led them once again through water out of Egypt into the promised land. God gave them the law at Mount Sinai and also instituted a new priesthood, uh, excuse me, and the Levitical sacrifices. And so all of this is laying the foundation for what Jesus will do in the new Passover when he liberates us uh, from sin and he gives us the new Passover meal, the perfect sacrifice in the Mass. He gives us also the new law. Right? If you look at the Sermon on the Mount, uh, it's in contrast to Mount Sinai, fulfilling the law of Moses through love, through the love of the Holy Spirit in our hearts that enables us to live like Jesus. The next covenant is through David. And God made an extraordinary promise to David. He said that one of David's descendants would sit upon his throne forever. And so the Davidic kingdom and the monarchy that was created and established throughout the kingdom of Israel is once again a direct foreshadowing of the kingdom of God that Jesus would enact. And his reign at the right hand of the Father will last forever. So that's really crucial for understanding how Jesus is the Messiah. The word Messiah means the anointed king. And so Jesus comes as the son of David to enact this new kingdom, which begins in his church and will be perfected and fulfilled um, in heaven. Following David, though, there's a huge crisis in the life of Israel. The Davidic kings, rather than being faithful to the covenant of Moses and to David, mostly turn against it. And they commit abominations against the Lord and turn away from the true worship. And so God allows his people to go into exile in Babylon. And so the teaching of the prophets that comes both before and after, before, during, and after the exile, um, is basically trying to lead them beyond just the earthly kingdom, which had been taken away, to point to the perfect and new covenant that will come. So you see this particularly in Jeremiah um, in Ezekiel, where they're talking about this new covenant, which will come and will be on the heart, right? So there's this foreshadowing of the final and eternal covenant that comes in Jesus. So Jesus begins enacting this new covenant at the Last Supper, where he pledges his body and blood as the eternal sacrifice, and he fulfills this on the cross. 
and brings us to new life in the resurrection. This is the eternal and perfect covenant that brings us salvation and culminates the story. It doesn't bring the story to an end, but it's the heart of the story that gives it all meaning, as we were saying. And so the church is the extension of salvation history following this everlasting covenant. And so we are living this covenant and sharing it with the world, um, bringing it to completion in the sense that Jesus said, that the gospel would be preached to every nation and that we, that we would baptize and make disciples. So this is how we are following from um, this covenant. And we are, we are doing our part to live it and participate in it, including uh, through the Mass, when we enter into it uh, by eating Jesus' body and drinking his blood. One of the things that I think is crucial about having the church as the continuation of salvation history in the narrative is that we are part of this story. Salvation history doesn't end, um, and we even see this in the book of Revelation, right? The Bible's narrative is not complete until the wedding feast of the Lamb begins with a new heaven and a new earth. So we're still living in biblical time, right? The biblical revelation is complete, but the narrative of the Bible extends all the way until the new heaven and new earth are enacted. And so we want to help the kids to understand that they are part of the story of salvation history and that it continues through the church today. Okay, so just a few other points to help us to understand uh, what the Bible is and how to use it in catechesis, uh, building off of the narratio. Um, it's very important for us to understand in catechesis that the Bible is the Word of God. Um, the Bible is inspired by God, and it's inerrant, meaning it's without uh, errors. Um, it's God's Word meant for our salvation. So this is God's Word spoken um, through the human authors, but He's also speaking to each one of us. That's very important for catechesis to understand that it's not just this word that was spoken once and for all, but it's speaking to us right now. It's God's voice, God's word directed to us. Uh, God inspired the many human authors of the Bible. So we can say that God is the ultimate author of the Bible, and yet so are the human authors, right? They, they are truly authors. They're rooted in their own time and place. And so historical studies of the Bible are very important to help us to understand its meaning. We also want to look at the Bible as a whole. Right? It's a very long narrative when you, when you look all the way back through the life of Israel and then into the church. And in the midst of it, right, Jesus is that center point. Uh, St. Augustine said that when we read the Old Testament, right, we see that it is fulfilled in the New Testament, but we also see the New Testament foretold in the Old. This is part of the way that we see this unity, is that the two Testaments really are speaking to one another and helping us to understand one another. So we don't want to read them in isolation. We also speak of four senses of Scripture. The literal sense is just the direct meaning of the words as you're reading the passage. Right? So we say the literal or historical sense is just rooted in the direct meaning. The other senses are called the spiritual sense. The allegorical is the way in which we see Jesus present in, in, throughout the entire Bible. Right? So even when Jesus is not directly referred to, the allegorical sense still points us to him uh, through that passage. Uh, we have the moral sense. It's also called the tropological sense, but moral is a lot easier. So we'll say the moral sense. And this is as we're reading the passage, it's teaching us how to live, right? So even if the passage is not like directly about a virtue or a commandment, it still should inspire us uh, to follow God and, and to live a holy life. That's the moral sense. The anagogic sense is the sense that points us to eternal life and to the ultimate meaning of the text in union with God. And so this is the, the sense that points us 
to the very purpose of the Bible, which is bringing us into this eternal union with God in heaven. Another important point um, as we're reading the Bible is that um, as we're trying to understand it, it's important to know that we are not the ultimate interpreters of the Bible, right? The church helps us to read the Bible and to understand the Bible. And so the guidance of the magisterium, and the magisterium means the teaching authority of bishops, right? So the, the teaching authority of the church helps us to know what the Bible means and corrects us from um, heretical interpretations. Right? So a lot of times the magisterium speaks if people start saying crazy things based on the Bible. And so a lot, or even we could say just about all heresies that have happened throughout the church have come from incorrect readings of the Bible. One of the major heresies in church history is Arianism. Arius was an Egyptian priest who said that God the Father created Jesus as a separate creature. The Word of God was a divine-like being created by the Father, but not one and equal with the Father. But how did Arius come to that understanding? Well, he says, well, John's Gospel says the Father is greater than I. Well, see, it says in the Bible that the Father is greater than the Son. Well, the magisterium had to step in and say, yes, but the Bible also says in the same Gospel, John's Gospel, I and the Father are one. And so the magisterium helps us to understand how the Father can be greater than the Son and how the two can still be one, the one God together. Because the Son has taken on our humanity. And because um, the Son in his humanity is less than the Father, you can say the Father is greater than I, right? Insofar as Jesus took our human flesh. But they are one because the Son is eternally begotten by the Father. He proceeds forth from the Father as one with Him. And so the church guides us to be able to read the Bible correctly as a whole and not just take out certain passages and run with them and get into all kinds of trouble. We also have the guidance of the church fathers, right? So in the early church, uh, the church fathers, when you look at their teaching, it's mostly um, sermons and other writings interpreting the Bible. And so that witness in the early times of the church coming from the apostolic teaching is also very important as the church reads the Bible. Uh, one example that I've found uh, for somebody who is able to bring together modern historical scholarship uh, on the literal sense of the Bible, um, bringing out the spiritual meanings of the Bible, the teachings of the church fathers and the magisterium's teaching, Bringing that all together into a coherent narrative is Pope Benedict XVI's uh, three volumes, Jesus of Nazareth. So I'd really point to that as an example of how to read the Bible well and all of these different dimensions that we were just talking about. Okay, so we're now ready uh, for another discussion. So we're going to pause the video here. And here are some points I'd just like you to reflect upon. Uh, whether yourself or in your group, and, and, and discuss. Um, how have you seen the Bible used, or unfortunately not used, in catechesis? How familiar are you with these touch points of salvation history that we talked about? And there are a number of good resources to help us to get more familiar with them. The Great Adventure uh, Timeline, you know, by Ascension Press is one. Um, is one example of that, but there, there are many other ways too. How can you incorporate the Bible more in your own teaching? So that's something really to reflect upon. Uh, is there any coordination between your catechetical program and the Sunday Mass readings? Right? I've heard many good examples of classes reading the coming Sunday readings together and talking about them. Um, so that's something to consider. How can we help form identity through biblical stories, right? Stories are very important for understanding who we are in relation to the Bible. So sometimes these stories can help us to really enter into the biblical vision of life and to understand who we are as children of God. And how can we use the Bible stories to help people to meet God, right? How can we use them as an encounter um, for knowing God's plan uh, for our lives? Okay, so we'll take a break at this point uh, and...
have a discussion of these questions. This final segment will just summarize and wrap up what we've been saying about why the Bible is so important for catechesis. So we're just going to have a brief reflection here on, well, how should we teach using the Bible? Well, for one thing, the Bible just needs to be present um, in our catechetical sessions. So it's very important just to read even short passages from the Bible. Why? Because if we're doing that, we're allowing God's Word to speak directly to the students. And we shouldn't underestimate the power of God's Word. When we read it and they hear God speaking to them directly, it has the power to move their hearts. And so we want to actually ask God to do that. You know, Lord, as we're reading this passage, please speak directly to us. Please move our hearts in the way that you want to. So it's one way in which God the teacher literally becomes the teacher um, in our catechesis. So just making the Bible present in any way, making God's Word front and center. And that way, catechesis really is that echo, echoing of God's Word into our own lives. Secondly, uh, we need to be praying the Bible. So we're trying to model that a bit, even in the art of catechesis here, with our Lexio sections at the beginning. Lexio Divina, once again, a divine reading. Um, and it, this is so crucial because it shows us how the Bible is a conversation. Uh, the Bible is not just God speaking to us, but it should initiate our response back to God's Word, our Word spoken back to Him. And so Lexio Divina, and we're going to come back to this in our last session, is listening to the Word, thinking and receiving uh, the Word, thinking about it and receiving it, praying back, this is our words spoken back in the conversation, and then just sitting still and receiving then in our hearts what God wants to give us through contemplation, and then being inspired to live differently, to act uh, based on the word that we received. So we want to pray with God's word in catechesis. We also, as I, as I mentioned, have the opportunity to use uh, the, the readings from Mass in our catechesis. And this shows us the liturgical dimension of catechesis, right? The catechesis orders us to the Mass and to all of the sacraments. And so it's important that we teach the kids how to listen to the Word at Mass and how to respond to the Word given to us in the readings at Mass um, through uh, just being able to enter into the prayers of the Mass. So to show how, the, how this, the two dimensions, right, of breaking open the word and breaking the bread, they go together. They reinforce one another, and they both enable us to encounter God. And so we want to show this liturgical connection between the word and the breaking of the bread through our catechesis. We also want to use our own stories. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Lord of the Rings, but... I highly recommend the books even a lot more than the movies. So if you've seen the movies and you haven't read the books, I really recommend reading the books. And I think, you know, just entering into literature deeply and, and reading helps us then to be able to approach the Bible as well, right? So we want to attune our minds to be able to be attentive, to contemplate, and to be able to receive. So the Lord of the Rings are, are a good example of kind of Catholic-inspired literature. And as Frodo and Sam are journeying into Mordor, and things are getting really dark, uh, Frodo and Sam have a couple of conversations in which they're thinking back to the old stories. And so, so Sam says, Frodo, you remember the old stories of the great heroes and all of the difficult things that they faced? Wonder what they would think about what we're going through now, right? You know, aren't we kind of in a situation like the old stories? And so he, basically what's happening here is that Frodo and Sam are gaining courage by thinking back to the old stories. It's an example of using the narratio to, to gain insight and courage and inspiration for following God now, 
And it shows how the story continues to impact us now. But then they, Frodo and Sam continue the conversation and they say, I wonder if people will ever tell stories about us. You know, what will they say about you, Frodo? And, and then Frodo says, well, we can't forget about Sam, right? Frodo wouldn't have gotten far without Sam, you know? And, and they begin to see their place in the bigger narrative throughout time. They understand that, hey, we're part of this story too. And our actions are going to impact the future. The story goes on. And so I think it's very important for catechesis to use all kinds of stories uh, to help the kids to sort of reflect on the importance of their life within this bigger perspective. So the Bible is the story, right? You know, that has to be the central story. But it's the lives of the saints. It's understanding the story of our own lives. It's using other things like uh, the Lord of the Rings and, and the Chronicles of Narnia as secondary stories to sort of look at a biblical worldview. Uh, so there's many ways in which we can, we can include stories to teach like God. Uh, we also want to show how um, the biblical passages that we're reading connect to Jesus and the church. Because sometimes, you know, if you're reading passages in the Old Testament, you can say, well, that's nice that that happened to Abraham, but how does that impact my life? You know, why do I care what happened to Abraham or Moses? So it's very important to reflect on the stories and how they relate to the church and how they all point to Jesus and unlock the Bible through that. So that the kids begin to say, oh, okay, I see it now. I understand why these stories matter. And then as catechists, we need to continue studying the Bible. So Lexio Divina is a great way to do that. I mean, just reading part of a chapter or reading a chapter every day and praying through that. It's a great way to get in our daily prayer, um, but it's also a great way just to understand the Bible more. Uh, the Augustine Institute came out with a uh, read the Bible in a year uh, text. So it actually gave you, it gives you the text for each day to be able to work through the Bible in 365 days. So that's one example of a way that you can actually get through the Bible in a reasonable amount of time. So uh, feel free to continue the conversation on uh, with your group and to continue reflecting on ways that the Bible can shape catechesis um, in your parish. Uh, and let's end uh, once again uh, with a glory be. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>